Amen. All right, tonight we're in Genesis chapter number 50. This is, of course, the last chapter of the book of Genesis. Uh, so it went by really fast. We, I think we only, uh, and I, th I think I questioned uh, a couple of people about this. I couldn't remember. I felt like there was another chapter that I split in half besides 19, but no one remembers, right? Genesis 19 is the only one. In true, you know, X. New IFB style, we had to dedicate half of uh, Genesis 19 to the Sodomites. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, so tonight is going to be the finale. We went through the book of Genesis, 50 chapters in, it would have been 51 weeks then. So it flew by. Well, a couple of things I want to uh, speak to you in summary that you maybe you didn't notice when we went through the book of Genesis. Of course, we have in the beginning, you know, creation. We have Adam and Eve, the story of Adam and Eve, the story of Cain and Abel. Then you have their children, you know, Seth and, and you know, the godly seed that it follows down to Genesis 6. You have what takes place with Noah and the flood. Then, of course, we have the Tower of Babel. And then it picks up almost immediate with, immediately with Abraham. It talks about Terah, goes to Abraham. And Abraham uh, takes place all the way unto Genesis 25. So maybe you haven't noticed this before, but from Genesis 25... All the way to Genesis 50 is actually about um, Jacob and his children. Jacob is introduced in Genesis 25. So Jacob is discussed and is really the subject all the way to Genesis 37. And then now, uh, in the latter portion of the book of Genesis, it becomes Joseph being the subject. So that is an overview, if you will, a bird's eye view of the book of Genesis. And once you get to Genesis 25, it's with Jacob all the way to Genesis 37. And then from Genesis 37, it's basically all the way about uh, Joseph unto the end. Of course, jo Jacob is still discussed a lot, but... It's really very much centered on Joseph. And as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago and last week as well, you have uh, Genesis chapter number, really the end of Genesis 47. When Jacob finds out that his father's sick, jo uh, Joseph goes to Jacob at that point, has a conversation with him about burying him and about his death. Genesis 48 is where you see Jacob being sick and Joseph is called and goes to him and then there's continuity all the way from the beginning of Genesis 48 all the way here to Genesis chapter number 50 and on through Genesis 50 here we're gonna see in this chapter we're gonna see the death of Joseph so it ends very much you know uh, this uh, let me say it this way Genesis 50 is very much a, a literary uh, finality if you will it's the closing of the end of the book it ends perfectly it was very much as I said centered on Joseph and then this is gonna be the closing chapter of the character and we'll see the end of his life that is Joseph so at the end of 49, let me say this right before we jump into it, we saw the death of Jacob. We, that's what we saw, and that picks up right here in Genesis chapter number 50, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Joseph fell upon his father's face, and wept upon him, and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, obviously that's, these are doctors, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel, and forty days were fulfilled for him, for so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. Now, you know, I'm not a physician, right? And I don't work in, in a morgue or anything like that. But when someone is embalmed today, about how long does it normally take? I mean, they die and you go to the funeral, you know, not very much long after that. So what would you say? Two days it would take, you know, just a couple of days, a few days when someone is embalmed today. And I remember the very first time that, that I read Genesis, or one of the first times that I read uh, Genesis. I just remember it was in my Schofield Reference Bible at that time, so that was one of the first few times that I read it. I remember seeing that and thinking that that's super interesting, that he was in Egypt. And of course, it tells you here that there were 40 days fulfilled while he was embalmed. And what, it, what do you think of, like when you're a child, of course, and you're, you know, uh, you're studying about Egypt, or you learn about Egypt in school, what you think of normally, what I think of is pyramids, and mummies, right? And so they have a serious procedure when it comes to embalming. And that's probably what this is referring to is the fact that he was made into some sort of, uh, you know, their process of, of mummifying people is what I would assume that this is, is going on here. I mean, this is some serious embalming for 40 days he's embalmed. And it says that that is their practice, right? So we can see some historical accuracy. And of course, the Bible's always historically accurate from 
the history that lines up with what we have of going in and digging up these bodies. The bodies are heavily preserved. Unlike any other culture, bodies are preserved of the dead in Egypt. And we see them practicing, from the documentation here in the Bible, we see them practicing some serious uh, uh, embalming. So look there in verse number 4. The Bible says, And when the days of his mourning were past, that's Joseph, of course, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in your eyes, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shalt thou bury me. Now therefore let me go up, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. So that took place at the end of chapter 47. This conversation that Joseph had with Jacob when he put his hand under his thigh, if you remember that, and he made him swear that when he died that he was going to bury him. And now we see Joseph, he's speaking to the servants of Pharaoh saying to go tell Pharaoh that, hey, this is the situation. My father died and I swore to him, I promised him that I was going to bury him in you know, uh, our land, the land of Canaan. But he makes sure that he says, hey, I'm going to be coming back. So you've got to think with the, the responsibilities that Joseph has. Basically, he's running everything. Pharaoh is basically not doing anything. So Joseph is in charge of everything. Everything is committed unto his hand, right? And he has a lot of power and a lot of authority. They're, you know, they're just you know, getting through this famine, towards the end of this famine, I would guess, at this point. And uh, it would be a big deal for Joseph to leave. I'm sure that's why he's, he's being uh, you know, so sincere, so, so uh, uh, diligent about saying, hey, to make sure that he knows that I will be coming back again. Verse number 6, <clears throat> And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt. So right here we can see the benefits of having character in our life. We can see the benefits of having character as an employee. When you're working for someone, you can see how Pharaoh was more lenient with him and was, and was letting him you know, uh, take this leave. And of course it's because he's been so faithful unto him all throughout his time while he was serving for Pharaoh. When we look at Joseph, one of the main uh, descriptives of Joseph is that he is an extremely faithful person. He's made a steward, of course, of Potiphar's house, and he's extremely faithful with everything that he has. He gives, you know, basically everything into his hand. That's Potiphar gives everything into Joseph's hand, and he's extremely faithful and does a good job with it. He's a, a diligent servant. And obviously he, had the, he was falsely accused and had the mishap. He's brought out of that. And he, did the, he was able to build himself back up to the top with Pharaoh as well. Of course, God was with him. But God was with him because he was a godly man. God's not just blessing this wicked, horrible, lazy person, right? He was blessing his work because he was working hard. So we can see the benefits of him being... Now, do you think that if he was just a terrible worker or he wasn't doing well and things like that, do you think that he would have given him these benefits? Do you think that he would have paid him $26? No, I'm just kidding. Do you think that he would have given these benefits to him if he would have been you know, not doing or slacking on his job lately? Of course not. It's because he had character. And not only that, notice that he tells them, hey, you know, take the servants as well. You know, the servants of Pharaoh went up there. So not only did he, what, did he allow him to, to, you know, to take this, it's not necessarily a vacation, but he allowed him to take this leave during this time when he needed it. But he also even sent his servants with him to help him with the labor and to do some of the work. I don't know if you notice that there. It says that with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh. So all, all of Pharaoh's servants he sent with him to help him. That's why. Because, because you can tell that uh, uh, Pharaoh adored Joseph. You could see all the power, the authority that he looked up to him. God was with him, of course, but he was a faithful man. We can see that that's recorded. So you see the benefits of being a hard worker, of being a faithful man, someone that, that a, an employer can trust. It's good to have character in all areas of our life. It's not only just, you know, to your employer or as an employee. Look at verse number 8. It says, And all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds, left, they left in the land of Goshen. That's also known as the land of Ramses, just to remind you. Verse 9, 
And there went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. So this is an extremely large drove of people, many, many people, large caravan. Verse 10, And they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan. And there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. Lamentation is like crying or weeping. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. So he had these seven days, you know, where he was just mourning for his father. Obviously cared for his father very, very much. He had a very close relationship with his father. Verse 11. And when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the floor of Atad, they said, this is a grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore, the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Mechpelah, which, it, which Abraham bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all that went up with him to bury his father, after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite. That means like kind of like recompense or return. Requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph saying, Thy father did command before he died saying, So shall ye say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did, <clears throat> excuse me, for they did unto thee evil. And now, we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. It says, and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. So what's interesting is in verse number 15 it says, when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead. So notice it's when that they saw that their father was dead that that is when they decided to send a messenger to Joseph. So to me the text kind of implies that maybe his brethren didn't actually have this conversation with their father. Maybe, you know, Jacob actually didn't tell, you know, the, the children of Israel, hey, you know, uh, make sure that you speak with Joseph and, uh, and that Joseph, you know, needs to forgive you and, and all of that, how all of that went back and forth with him. Maybe that conversation didn't really happen and because they're concerned that they're worried about Joseph, as it says, requiting unto them this evil. They know that Joseph has this great relationship with Jacob and that Joseph honored Jacob and loved him very much. And if he knew that, hey, Jacob, your father doesn't want you, you know, to return this unto us and he wants you to forgive us, well, then maybe Joseph will then go ahead and and, and not return this evil unto us, you know, if he was going to. That's kind of how the text reads to me. Now, it's possible that maybe Jacob had this conversation with Joseph, or with, I'm sorry, with the 12, uh, 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 the, uh, the ele other 11, that would be, the other 11 sons. But uh, it seems to me that all of a sudden when he dies, they start talking amongst each other and then they send a messenger. And of course it's because they're worried. Because they know that what they did was extremely wicked. They know that the sin that they committed and the transgression that they committed under their brother was extremely horrible. And notice how Joseph responds at the end of verse number 17 when he hears this. It says, And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. So you can already see like what is his predisposition of the, about this. And we know that Joseph has forgiven them. We already saw that before, but maybe they thought that that was just a show. Maybe they thought that that was just him just putting that on because he's able to see his father and he was just getting along with them during that period of time just because of his father. Look at verse number 18. It says, And his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. So you can see them expressing extreme humility. And you have to, again, remember the relationship that they have now with Joseph is he is basically the king of Egypt. So they're not just looking at him as their brother. I mean, they're, you know, they were very much disconnected from one another for many, many years. But when they see him, I mean, he has extreme amount of power. He can put them all to death just by the snap of his fingers, right? So they come before him and they fall down before him. 
And they say, Behold, we be thy servants. They're saying, you know, we'll, we're your servants. We'll do anything, that we, basically, that you want us to do. They're just in great humility, right? They're begging for forgiveness, basically, is what they're doing. And then Joseph rep responds and says, And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, <clears throat> for I, am I in the place of God? So he's, he's explaining to them that it's, that it's not his job to requite evil. It's not his job to return unto them what they deserve. He's saying it, that, he, he, that it's not his responsibility, that it's God's responsibility to pay back those that do bad, right? You know, we, don't, we shouldn't go around and you know, exact vengeance on people that do us wrong, right? When someone does us wrong, we're supposed to suffer it. We can see these Christian principles that Jesus clearly teaches in the New Testament, Paul teaches in his writings. We can see people practicing this and, and this being taught also in the Old Testament as well. And that's what he's doing. You know, he was, he was treated poorly. He was mistreated and he just suffered it, didn't he? He forgave his brethren and he suffered it and he understood that, hey, it's not my job. Am I in the place of God? you know, to, to try to recompense to you what you deserve? Even if we knew that someone did us wrong, do you think that you could justly punish that person back? Of course not. You don't know what the exact punishment is that someone would deserve. That's why it's only God can dish out perfect justice. So that's why it wouldn't even make sense if you tried to go out, unless it was a prescription from God, like when a nation goes in in the Old Testament or something like that, and God tells you what the judgment or what the justice would be. But in a personal case like this, in our lives personally, of course we're not going to go around and pay people back. We, as Joseph sets the example, and we're taught in the New Testament, should suffer it. We should suffer it when people do us wrong. Look at verse number 20. Joseph says this, But as for you, ye thought evil against me. So you wanted to do evil, or you wanted to do harm to me. But God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. Now we know that Joseph was used to save the nation of Egypt and also all the nations round about. It talks about all the people from Canaan and other nations coming unto Joseph and he was feeding them and he was keeping them all alive. So when this is talking about saving much people alive, that's what it's referring to, that Joseph being sold into Egypt put him in the perfect circumstance where he could be used by God in the future when the famine arises and then Joseph is there to be able to step into this position to go to Pharaoh and then, of course, you know, to save much people alive. He serves as a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in doing so. And then this brings the prophecy to pass how the uh, other 11 brethren come down afterwards. They end up moving down into Egypt after them. So right there you can see another a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in Joseph. Notice how it says to save much people alive. I mean, what is Jesus? He is the Savior, right? He, you know, uh, of course, Joseph here saved his brethren. And, you know, Jesus, Jesus' his name is that he came to what? Save his people from their sins. So you can see a great picture there. Joseph has been a strong picture of Jesus all throughout uh, the book of Genesis. There are for sure more points uh, that line up with Jesus and Joseph than any other picture or any other figure uh, of a person in the Old Testament. For sure, Joseph serves as the greatest picture uh, as of the Lord Jesus Christ than any other person. So I want you to turn though to uh, Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. So his brethren, of course, they sold him into Egypt and they wanted something bad to happen to him. This was meant for something, you know, evil. It says that they meant it evil. That's what Joseph said, right? That they meant evil unto him or against him. And let me say this also, a lot of evil did come about. A lot, he did suffer a lot of harm, didn't he? He went through a lot of bad. I mean, you know, we don't know the exact period of time throughout each, each different phase of his life of how long he's in Potiphar's house and how long he's here and how long he's there. And, you know, he's in prison for a period of time. I mean, a lot of the time that Egypt spent, uh, that, I'm sorry, that Joseph spent in Egypt was negative. He went through a lot of negativity. He went through a lot of harm. A lot of bad things happened to him, right? I want you to look with me at Romans chapter number 8, verse number 28. The Bible says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, 
to them who are the called according to his purpose. So notice what the Bible teaches here. It says, and we know that all things work together for good. Now, does it say that all things are good to them that love God? No, it doesn't. It doesn't say that just all positive things, all good things are going to happen to you if you love God. That's another thing I want to point about, out about this too. It's not just talking about those that are saved, right? It says, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. And then it says this, and, or I'm sorry, it says, to them that are called according, the called according to his purpose. So notice that, yeah, they're the saved, but they're also those that love God. Notice that. That's super important to them. That does. Do you think that every single Christian just has a burning love for God in their hearts? Then why would 1 John chapter number 2 be in the Bible where there's an admonition to a Christian to love God and not to love the world? Right? You would have no reasons to have these types of commands. You would have no reason to have commandments given to Christians over and over again to love God. Because Christians can fall in love with things of the world. So specifically, this person that it's talking about is a person that's saved, but not just saved, a person that loves God. A person that has the love of God in their hearts. Jesus said, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Answer this question. Do all Christians keep his commandments? No. So do the Christians that aren't keeping his commandments love God or love Jesus? No. You know, that's the conclusion. of That's how you deduce that, right? This specifically says that all things work together for good to them that love God. To, and then to the call, the, those that are called, the called according to his purpose, right? So it's the saved, but it's those that love God. So not everything is positive to those that are saved. So notice how there's two you know, uh, misunderstandings that you'll hear oftentimes about this passage. Number one, yes, it's the saved, but it's a, a specific group within those that are saved, within those that are the children of God. It's those that are the saved that love God, those that are serving God, those that are keeping God's commandments to them. It says, and not will everything work out perfect for them in their lives, but all things will work together for good. So notice that. Now we're very uh, familiar with the New Testament. Is the New Testament just like this, this picture, uh, this picture perfect life of all of the Christians throughout the book of Acts? Is that what's going on? They're all just like living in these mansions and everything's perfect with their lives and they never have any fights with their wife and, and everything is just, all their children, everything's great all the time. They have all this money. There's no persecution. It's the exact opposite of that. When we look in the Bible, Christians, those that are serving God, are oftentimes going through hard times. Very often they're receiving persecution. They're going through rough times in their life. So if you have this idea that, hey, the Christian life or my Christian life, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. You know, my life is just going to be perfect. I'm going to lay out this, this, and this. I got an IRA I'm putting all my money into. And I'm not telling you, I'm not saying anything against all of those types of things. But hey, the point is this. Number one, we should be focusing on the things above. Not laying up treasures on this earth, but laying up treasures above. But the point is this, that as a Christian, you should expect bad to happen to you. And don't be surprised when bad things happen to you. You should understand that you're going to be persecuted. You're going to, you should understand that you're going to be hated of the world. You know, we can look at examples in the Bible and see that and understand that. You know, that, that we, you know the, the Bible is very clear over and over again as Christians that we should expect persecution. We should expect, you know, to suffer for the cause of Christ. So we don't see Joseph's life being perfect. Far from it. We see Joseph going through a lot of hard times. But do you know what God was doing the, the whole time while that was happening? God was using those trials. God was using the persecution from others. God was using even the evil intent of his brethren's heart to try to harm, the, harm him, Joseph that is. He was using that to bring about something good later. He was using that to bring about good not only for Joseph, but good for you know Egypt, for Canaan, for all the nations round about him. God was using that all along, and then that blessing came through Joseph to all the children of Israel, and Joseph received it as well. So, you know, we as Christians should expect persecution. Go back to Genesis chapter number 50. We as Christians should, should expect persecution. Not only that, we should just expect uh, a hard times in our life. Trials, tribulations. You know, that's what we should expect. 
There's no reason why you should think that your life is just going to be perfect, especially being a Christian and being promised persecution. You know, the Bible tells us that, that they that live, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. All of them. Everyone. So if you live godly, you will suffer persecution in this life. It's going to happen. But you can always rest assured that God can use the harm that is brought upon you, that evil that is being brought upon you, that God can use that and bring about good in your life and, and even good and blessings upon others as well. So it says there, God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Look at verse number 21. Now therefore fear ye not, fear ye not I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. I want you to go again to the New Testament. Go to Colossians chapter number 3. Colossians chapter number 3. Now I mentioned there a moment ago uh, how Joseph was a very great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in the book of Genesis. <clears throat> and we see many ways how he was a great picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we saw him being sold, you know, uh, into Egypt, you know, for the 20 pieces of silver. And Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. We saw, you know, how he was sold by Judah, uh, it would be Judah in the Old Testament, and you know, Judas sold Jesus, which it's obviously the same name. I went over that. Uh, there are so many, how he's thrown in the pit. I mean, there are so many ways, right? He brings the, you know, the, the, the bloody garment that's brought back to his father, right? That's obviously a picture, the vesture. That's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are so many different ways how Joseph is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But another way is by his great forgiveness that he shows to his brethren. And it's easy for us to overlook, you know, exactly what they did to him. You got to stop and, and, and put yourself in his shoes and, and understand exactly how bad it was that his own flesh and blood is closest to kin, what they did to him and what they intended. And he understood exactly what they wanted to happen. That they intended evil, he says. You, you wanted evil to come about this, right? You wanted evil to happen to me. So he understood that, hey, you're trying to sell me into slavery, that they were even debating and wanting to kill him. And they were like, what does it profit us? So it was even lower than that. They wanted to kill him, but they were like, let's at least make some money off of him. What profit is it if we don't, you know, at least sell him, you know, make some money off this little guy, right? So they ended up taking him and, and selling him into slavery, not caring at all what happened to him, right? Then he sees, he ends up seeing them, you know, what was it, 23 years later, I believe it was? Sees them many, many years later. And... What, how, how does he end up responding? Uh, just over a, a short period of time, of course, you know, in the beginning, I'm sure he felt anger. I'm sure he felt all these different things. But ultimately, what did he do for his brethren? He ended up forgiving his brethren. Now, they didn't understand that he was sincere in the beginning. We can see now, of course, and I'm sure they saw then when he really was sincere. But Joseph was able to sincerely from his heart forgive his brethren. And that serves as a great example to us on a human level, but also we can see the picture here of how Christ was able to forgive us. And Joseph forgiving his brethren, Christ forgiving his brethren. Look at Colossians chapter number 3, verse number 13. It says this, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So, Looking at Joseph as being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he was able to forgive us. He, us sinning against him. You know, every sin that we sin against one of our brethren, against our wife, against any other human, right? We are also sinning against God simultaneously at the exact same moment for those exact same sins, right? Every sin that you commit, you know, Oftentimes, sins that you commit, they're not, you know, just to God. Some of them are, but they're to people as well. So you've sinned against God, but you've also sinned against scores and scores of people. Tons of different people, right? So at the same time while you're sinning against God many times, you're sinning against all these different people. But think about this. How many, who, of all the people in the world, you know, Maybe your wife is the person that you've sinned against the most, right? Probably because you spend the most time together. You're the, close, you know, the closest uh, interacting with one another, right? But you, but you have sinned against God in your life, you know, a hundred times more than you've sinned against your wife or anyone else. So much more 
And you know what God was willing to do for us? Think about that. God was willing to forgive us, but not only forgive us, He's willing to die for us and take our punishment for us. Now, that same God is also called our brother. He is not ashamed to call them brethren. And you know what He was willing to do for us? He was willing to forgive His brethren. And what do we see Joseph doing? Joseph being treated horribly bad. Now, I don't know if every person in here can say, hey, I think I would forgive my brothers if they did that to me too as well. But I would say this, that the majority of people for sure on the planet would not forgive their brothers or sisters or anyone for that matter if they did to uh, them what Joseph's brethren did to Joseph, right? He was sinned against in a horrible way. But do you know what he did? He forgave his brother. He sincerely forgave his brother. To the point of when they're begging for forgiveness and they're, you know, uh, deluded to the point where they think that they're so misunderstanding the situation, where they think that Joseph is not forgiving them, that he begins to weep. That he starts crying. When they're begging for forgiveness, he's the one that starts crying. And he's explaining to them, like, hey, I know that you, you know, I forgave you. And I know that you meant this to be bad to me, but God worked it out for good. I mean, look at the great humility that Joseph had. And in spite of everything that they did to him, in spite of how bad, and I'm sure that they didn't get along good even earlier on in their lives. You can see that they're constantly, you know, uh, even, even in what's recorded in Scripture, a few different times they're saying things to him about his dreams. They're making fun of him a couple of different times, right? So he was probably mistreated a lot that we don't even know about, let alone the horrible you know, uh, a tragedy of being sold into slavery, and he was still willing to forgive his brother. Now, I doubt that anyone in here will ever sin against another person in here or another brother in here like how the 11 brethren sinned against their brother. I doubt that you're ever going to try to, you know, you know, Brother Anthony is going to take his brother or he's going to take Brother Elliot and try to sell him into slavery, right? He's going to try to sell him into, you know, uh, uh, you know, Haiti or something like that. I doubt that that's ever going to take place, right? So what you, can, what you can do is you can look at the great forgiveness that Joseph had towards his brethren. You can look at him as an example and you will never be sinned against like Joseph was. And, and that can show you, hey, it is possible. I can forgive my brother. This isn't even that bad. You can use that as an example. Not only that, just like Christ. I want you to look there at verse number 15, or I'm sorry, uh, verse number 13 once more. It says this at the end. Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. What does that mean? In the same way. The same way that Christ forgave us, that's how we should forgive our brethren. So there will be times when people are going to make you mad that go to church here, right? A lot of times when you get mad about stuff, it's normally petty and you're normally the problem. Most of the time when you're angry about something, it's normally something small. I'm not saying that people in here aren't really going to do bad things to other people, but a lot of times, you know, when people are getting mad about something, it's, it, it, it's misunderstood, it's, it's really, it ends up being nothing. They're, you know, really, you know, they're just reading into something. But sometimes people will actually do wrong to other people. They will hurt other people. They will have bad intent towards other people. You know what you need to do? You need to be like Joseph. You need to say, hey, I forgive you. God will work this out to good. I forgive you. I understand. When somebody comes to you and they ask for forgiveness, you need to be man enough to be willing to forgive them. You don't have this attitude where you're just like, you know, where you're so proud and you're so angry that they did. And that's oftentimes why people won't forgive others because they think so highly of themselves. Like, how dare you? I will never forgive you. Right? It's because they're, they're a proud person, because they build themselves up in their own mind. You know, we need to have a humble attitude, and we need to just brush it under the rug. We need to love our brethren and love all of our, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, Christian brothers and sisters. And we need to be like Christ. We need to be like Joseph. And if somebody does this wrong, and they come to you, and they admit it, and they say, hey, I repent, like it says in Luke 17, I repent, forgive me. You know what you need to do? Forgive them. You need to forgive them. You say, hey, I forgive you. No strings attached. I forgive you. That can be extremely difficult. Even if you don't want to. Even if you're struggling with it. In your heart, you need to make yourself. 
You need to decide, I'm going to do what's right. And, and tell that person, you know what? And if you're having trouble with it, be honest with them and just explain to them, hey, you know, I'm going to, I'm, you know, because I, I, I've, I've heard of people doing this before, this exact type of scenario. Somebody came with, to me with this issue where they were like, I'm just having trouble forgiving this person. I told him, well, you need to tell that person that you want to forgive them, but, they're, but you're struggling with it and talk to them about it. Because sometimes it can be a hard issue, right? You need to pray. You need to ask God to help you and guide you through it and say, God, please, you know, through the Holy Spirit, soften my heart and, and give me the ability. And you know what you just need to do? You need to get to the point where you force yourself I, and make yourself and over and over again think in your mind that that's what God wants you to do. Conform your mind to the Word of God. Actually, transform your mind. Don't be conformed to the world. Transform your mind to the Word of God and make yourself. In all situations, even if it hurts, even if it bothers you, get over it. Get over it. You need to forgive your brethren, no matter what they do to you. You're never going to be sinned against like Joseph did. And Joseph stood there and wept when they came to him. And he said, what am I in God's stead? Am I going to be the one that... You know, I'm going to you know, exact vengeance upon you or, or punish you how you should be punished. He said, hey, you know, you wanted to do something bad to me, but God worked this out for good. He forgave his brethren. So if your brethren ever sin against you, you know what you do? Be a Joseph and forgive them as well. Go back to Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis chapter number 50. <clears throat> Look there at verse number... 21, it says, Now therefore fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. And Joseph dwelt in Egypt, he and his father's house. And Joseph lived an hundred and ten years. So he, has, of course, lived a long life as, as well. Verse 23, And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were brought up upon Joseph's knees. So you notice over and over again the blessing of, of grandchildren. Children just in general are, are over and over again in the book of Genesis. Specifically, that's a theme where they're stressed as being a blessing. Verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to J Jacob. And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being an hundred and ten years old. And they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter number 11. So maybe take five minutes or so, and, and we're going to close out this chapter. Hebrews chapter number 11. We've been here before for this exact same purpose, but it's again relevant, and it's actually speaking of this exact... <clears throat> circumstance or incident, look at uh, Hebrews chapter number 11. I want you to look at verse number 22. It says this, By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So that was what we just read there where Joseph, when he was about to die at the moment while he was, he was about to take his last breath, he gave commandment to the children of Israel concerning his bones. And he spoke of the departing of Israel, how they were going to be brought out. Now he knew that because Abraham was told that. If you remember, God came to Abraham and spoke of them going down into a foreign land and they were going to be there for 400 years and they were going to be slaves there, right? I think it was 430 30 years exactly. They were going to be uh, bondmen there and afflicted, but then they were going to be redeemed and brought back out. So of course Joseph knew that was going to take place because Abraham taught that to his, his son Isaac and then taught that, of course, to Jacob and then also taught that to Joseph. So Joseph knew these uh, prophecies from Abraham ultimately, right? Not only that, he knew that they were promised the land. He knew that those promises were given, so he knew that he was going to be back in that land in some way or another. And notice here that this is at the moment of his death that he still had faith, even at his last dying breath. Look at verse number 21 also. It says this, By faith Jacob, when he was a dying. So what time period in Jacob's life is this talking about? This is right when he was about to die. It says, Blessed both the sons of Joseph. So this is chapter number 48 that we read about, when he blessed Ephraim and Manasseh. It says, And worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. 
So it's an interesting little detail we're given there in the New Testament. He's leaning on the top of his staff. And, he was, and it says that what he was doing in chapter number 48 was he was worshiping God. And we know that he was, he was blessing Ephraim and Manasseh. And this was in his last moments. This was when he was about to die, it says. It tells you when he was dying. It mentions that about both Jacob and Joseph. And I pointed this out a few weeks ago. But look at verse number 13. It says this. These all died in faith. Now a lot of people will misunderstand this important point because it's not just saying that they had faith in their lives. It's not just saying that they lived, you know, lives of strong faith. It's specifically, and I've never had anyone point this out before, but I think it's important because the context shows that it's important. It's specifically talking about that they died in faith. That at their last dying breath, they still had trust or they still had faith in the Word of God. How do you know that? Because it tells you these all died in faith and then it gives you examples of who? Jacob. When he was dying. Then it tells you by faith Joseph when he died. What's that saying? At the, right when he was dying. It's saying the exact same time. Right at the moment. Right before he died. Right? What did he do? He expressed his faith by saying, hey, carry my bones out of here. Why? Because he knew that there was a promise that was given to him. That, he had, he, that, that God had given the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, that there was this promise and this blessing, and he believed it. Look at verse 13. Let's read the rest of it. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So notice that it says, not having received the promises. While Joseph was alive, did he receive the promise of, you know, of, of setting foot and, and owning the land and living in the promised land? He did not, did he? He did not. That's what this is speaking about. He did not receive, and that's why this chapter talks about the city, right? That they wanted a city. They were searching for a city. So these are the promises that it's speaking of. The promise of the promised land. And even at their dying breath, they still trusted God. Even though there were things that didn't quite make sense to them, you know, it wouldn't quite make sense looking back. And, you know, why wasn't Joseph actually himself put into the promised land? Why did he obtain the promised land in his life? Why did God come to Abraham and say, unto you and unto your seed, you know, I'm going to bless and I'm going to give you this land. But then the Bible tells you in Acts 7 that he never got any of that land in his lifetime. But you know what they still did? Even when they didn't understand and where there were certain things that didn't make sense to them, they still trusted God even unto their last breath. And they tried to work out ways even. That's what you can see Joseph doing here. You can see Joseph trying to figure out like, hey, I know that I'm going to that land. Carry my bones there when I die. This is why it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them. And it says, And embraced them. And you see a, a real interesting thing with, with Isaac. Of course, when we went over this in Genesis chapter number 22. Abraham and Isaac, how Abraham offered up Isaac. And it says that from whence he received him in a figure. So you can see that there are these figures that represent Christ or represent the promised land or the promise and they'll embrace those things and you can see them expressing their faith through that. That's exactly what Joseph is doing here as well. When Joseph is telling him at the end of his life, he's telling him, hey, carry my bones up there and bury my bones there. Why was he saying that? Because he believed the promise. That's what it comes down to. He believed that promise. He believed God and he counted God faithful. And he knew one way or another, whether he understood all of it, I, that's going to be my land. I'm going to be there. I want you to go back to Genesis chapter number 50. Genesis chapter number 50. <clears throat> and keep your hand there. Make sure you're there. I don't know if you kept your hand there already. And, and in, in your right hand, get Luke. Luke chapter number 1. This will be the last place that we turn other than Genesis 50. And ultimately, it all, that promise always points to, points to Christ, one way or another. And Joseph makes this statement. He says this in verse number 24. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die. 
and then he says this, and God will surely visit you. Was he questioning or did he die in faith? He died in faith. You notice how he said it. He said, God will surely visit you. And he says this, and bring you out of this land, unto the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Now, did God visit them there and bring them out of Egypt? He did, right? But is that the true visitation of God when God came? And the Bible talks about when God brought them out of Egypt that He redeemed them. That exact word is used multiple times. He re redeemed them as bondmen, right? He redeemed them from Egypt and brought them out of Egypt. That exact phrase and that type of language is used over and over again. I want you to look here in Luke chapter number 1, verse number 68. Notice what the Bible says here. It says, Verse number, let's look at verse number 67 first. And his father Zacharias, of course that's John the Baptist's father, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And then it says this, As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. So notice there in verse number 68, it tells you, it says, For he hath visited and redeemed his people. What's that talking about? How did he visit his people? It's talking about because the Lord Jesus Christ came and was born. That's how he visited his people. Joseph said in verse number 24, he said, I die and God will surely visit you. Now, did Joseph specifically understand exactly how it was going to work out with the Messiah coming, the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Did he understand every aspect of it? No, of course not. Just like Abraham didn't understand every aspect of the death, burial, and resurrection. But Joseph still died in faith. And ultimately, you know what he was doing? He was trusting in God to redeem him. He was trusting in God to visit his people. He was trusting in God ultimately to fulfill his promises, right? God has given us promises. The same exact promises that God gave to Joseph, that God gave to Abraham, that God gave to Isaac, and God gave to Jacob. Those exact same promises God gave to you. No difference at all, period. God gave you, you also those same promises. And God is just as faithful today to those promises as He was at the time that He gave them to Joseph. Now, Joseph, he, when he died at that moment, he didn't understand every aspect. We have so much more, you know, uh, of, of Scripture. We have so much more details when it comes to the promises of God than Joseph did. Than Joseph did, excuse me. But he still, he still, even when things didn't make perfect sense to him, he wasn't sure about everything, do you know what he still did? He still trusted God. That is... Overall, you know, what is, is emphasized in the Bible more than anything, really, is trusting in the Lord. All, the whole book of Psalms is about trust in the Lord, trust in the Lord, trusting in God, trusting in God. You know, number one, for your salvation, of course. But it doesn't only end there. Of course, you need to continually trust in God daily. You need to trust in God for, for everything. For all things, you know, we should, you know, cursed be the man that trusteth in man, that, you know, that makes, arm, that makes his arm, you know, his salvation or flesh his salvation, the Bible talks about over and over again, right? We need to, we need to not only, you know, put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, we need not only trust God today, but we need to purpose in our heart that we're going to continue to trust God throughout our lives. We need to purpose in our heart that we're going to continue to trust God all the way until our dying breath. All the way until the end of our life, what are you going to be? What are what state are you going to be in in your you know Christianity, your spirituality when you're on your deathbed? Are you still going to be having faith in God? Are you still going to be trusting in God? Are you going to be having? Are you going to be you know uh, uh, doubting things in your mind? Are you going to be tossed to and fro? Are you going to be steadfast like Joseph was, where he's able to say, "God will surely visit you." Look, listen to the confidence. In his statement, God will surely visit you. His last words, Joseph was just as confident that God was going to fulfill his promise as he was when he had first heard about it. This ties in with the, you know, the sermon that I preached a few weeks ago. We need to finish our course. Amen. We need to finish our, our Christian life. We need to, when we're on our deathbed, we still need to be trusting in God. 
We still need to be having our faith in God. We still need to be, at the end of our life, you know, bringing forth fruit. We still need to be serving God all the way until the end of our lives. Now, let me say this lastly. The book of Genesis, this is one more application to you. The book of Genesis, what you'll notice is it's very family-oriented. It's extremely family-oriented. And what I mean by that is the faith that is seen repeatedly is faith that is passed down from, from one generation to the next over and over again. You see from one generation to the next, to the, you know, Abraham, and you can see this all the way back. You see it starting with Adam, and then it follows a generation after that from Adam. And it does the same thing with Noah, and then it gets to Abraham, you know, from Terah to Abraham, and then all the way to Ephraim, Manasseh, all the way down, and then the third generation to Joseph. What do you think Joseph was doing when it talks about you know, his grandchildren sitting on his knees? What do you think he did when he's, he's, you know, how did Joseph know all the things about God that he did? Why was he serving God? Why was Isaac serving God? Why, how were these families able to keep intact this strong faith all the way to their last dying breath? Because they had a strong foundation within their family, the importance of serving God. Because when... Joseph's grandchildren were there, I'm positive he was teaching them the Word of God. I'm positive he was teaching unto them the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So over and over again, when you, when you look at the book of Genesis, it's following families. And you can see these people serving God fervently and having strong faith. That's a strong faith where on your, on your dying, on your deathbed, in your dying words, you're able to say, surely the Lord will visit you. God will surely visit you. We need to set that foundation for our children. We need to teach our children about the Lord. We need to strengthen our children in the promises of God. And from when they're very, very young, we need to start teaching them from the Word of God. As fathers and as mothers, we need to set aside time in our households where we are teaching our children the Word of God and strengthen their faith. And we want them also, when they get older, to have that same strong faith all the way into the end of their lives. We want them also to teach their children. We want them also to continue to teach their children. We want this to, to continue on and on and on, right? We want to lay a great foundation for our children, and it begins with you. Be, a lot of you may be first-generation Christians. That may not have been your case, right? Make sure that it doesn't end with you as well. Make sure that you can have, it, like it says, the third generation of Ephraim's child. So that's his great-great-great-grandson sat on his knee. He was able to see all the way to the third generation. What you need to do is try to make your Christianity stretch all the way to your great, great, great grandson where he's also serving God as well. And keep the faith all the way to the end so that we can also be able to say in our last words, God will surely visit you to our children. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the word of the God. We thank you for the book of Genesis. We thank you for the promises. We thank you for how faithful that you are, dear Lord, and we can trust in you.